Hello and welcome everybody to our rehearsal, you can say, for our common contribution for the Integral European Conference, which this time will be online. And our topic is Conscious Aging, an ongoing project. And I will speak a little bit more about that later. I have invited four of the many women and men more women than men, who have appeared in this um, on Conscious Aging project I had with Mark. I will talk about that later too. And they are here and they will cover several parts of Conscious Aging. But in the conference, you will also have the possibility to say yours and ask questions. Here in the recording, not. So I would invite you one after the other to say shortly who you are, where you are, and why are you so interested in this topic. And at the end, we will also do a longer presentation for every one of you, the possibility to share about your work. So first, what is conscious aging? What does it mean for you? Uh, I give over first to Monia. I thought you would give it to Jane. <laughs> Jane will do the first presentation. You oh, are sitting near me. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, so I'm Monia. I live in Vienna, Austria, center of Europe. And as I am nearing 79, uh, I try to find out what makes me what I am and maybe uh, what makes me conscious of being old and feeling young. Yeah, that's my approach to conscious aging. Who else wants to come next? I will. Um, I'm Jane Duncan Rogers. I run a social enterprise a not-for-profit organization called Before I Go Solutions, which helps people to make good end-of-life plans. I'm also the author of Before I Go, The Essential Guide to Creating a Good End-of-Life Plan, and another couple of books. And I got into this after my husband died in 2011. And the first book that I wrote, which was my memoir about that, there was a chapter in it where I had written about the questions that I asked Philip before he died. They were really practical ones like, how do you want your body to be dressed and what are your passwords and things like that. And reader's response to that was, I need to answer these questions too. And so that is really what birthed what I'm doing and why I care so passionately about people preparing well for a good end of life. Yeah, I'm, I'm Martina. I'm from um, Germany. I I work as as a gerontologist, um, mostly in nursing homes. I'm I'm a teacher for communication in the care of the elder for the elderly, and I'm a specialist in questions of um, dementia from an integral perspective. Yes, and I was drawn from, from the question, what is the reason for dementia many years ago? And um, from where does it arise? And this is one of my main drives in life to do research to this question. So I'm Anne Roberts. Uh, I live in a small village just south of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, my interest in conscious ageing is personal. It's a, a time of my life. And I went back to university when I retired and became what I call a social researcher. So I'm very interested in how this time of our life um, impacts on us and what is emerging at this stage as the baby boomers have healthy longevity. 
Um, this new stage that's emerging in the human life cycle fascinates me. And my interest is how we develop, what happens in adult development in this later time of our lives. So thank you all. Now to me, I started doing live broadcasts and video talks 2014. And then together with Mark, we founded the Wisdom Factory. And I have now prepared a few <clears throat> slides. Uh, we did first general topics, integral topics. The Wisdom Factory was intended to give a platform to integral people, let's say, who are working in the integral uh, mindset and who are not yet so famous to be invited to big talks and who could then um, have a platform to present what they are to doing, you know. Uh, it didn't work out so much. We had the, more the important people like Terry Patton or Jeff Sausman. They were <laughs> agreeing to come on our podcast. But then Mark he thought his mother was 100 when she died. He thought, oh, maybe I will have other 30 years of life. What will I do with that? And so he got very much interested in the idea of conscious aging. And so we started uh, a program, Conscious Aging, where we invited guests like the ones you saw here um, to speak about their ideas of conscious aging and what they are doing, what, what practices they have and so on. A little bit you have already heard about that. Now, everything started at the conference and the first conference, uh, no, it's the second actually in 2016, Mark did very eloquently a presentation about integral aging where he, where he went through all the stages and it was quite a an, um, success. And then this presentation, which I'm doing now, more or less, should have been in 2018. Um, but at the moment of the conference, he was serious, seriously, seriously ill. And so we sent a video and you see here the, the group of the conscious of, of the aging report watching our video at the conference. And then Mark died in June, almost two years ago. He is uh, buried in a very lovely graveyard. And you see, I had done by a friend of mine, an artist, the spiral, because he was so, 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 so inspired by the levels of development. He was really passionate about what he found out after he was uh, uh, retired. He learned all that integral and spiral dynamics uh, when he was retired. And since then I did, I, I counted it, 24 more, 23 more conversations with people on conscious aging, although I didn't feel it was really my topic then. But I thought uh, <laughs> to maintain the legacy, I would do that. And here I wrote it, uh, you can find all these conversations in the wisdomfactory.net and a little bit how it looks like season one, there was John Freeman and Ashton Applewhite and Monia. <laughs> and that's uh, on the left side. On the other side, there is the last season where also some German conversations are present. And then I wrote a little bit about you. I wrote your website, but I'm sure you will also uh, tell them when it's time for your uh, presentations but just to let people know that they can talk with you in some way. And they can see the talks we had before on my website. Wisdomfactory.net. That was a poster I prepared for the conference, which would have been in Hungary uh, this year. And I, I think it's almost all of the people who were present, maybe not all, but, but quite a few. Then Mark uh, created a Masterminding Integral Aging Facebook group, which he was very eager to cure, curate. I'm not so good in that, uh, so it's a little bit abandoned, but it's an invitation to everybody to, to come in and share and 
uh, give you a perspective and engage with other people. Then I've also created an integral aging website, which is, uh, it was intended for Mark, but he was not very much uh, into websites and all the technical stuff. So it's sort of so-so. But anyway, there are ways for you to engage uh, and to come together, also talk with me in another conversation on conscious aging or any other integral topic. And yeah, the, so far for me, I enjoy very much talking with people. We had also panel discussions and today we will give you a little bit of a, how can you say, a taste of what would be uh, in the conversations. And I stop share now. And I think we would start with Jane today. And she has, like everybody else, about 10 minutes of space to speak a little bit more about what she is up to with conscious aging. So over to you, Jane. You must unmute yourself. Thank mm -hmm. you. Forgot that. <laughs> Conscious aging, it's a huge topic and I come to it in a particular way. And it's interesting that you said, Heidi, that you um, didn't feel after Mark had died that it was somehow particularly your topic because when Philip, my husband, died and I wrote my first book, Gifted by Grief, it, I was working as a life um, as a life coach and a small business coach, and it never occurred to me that I would be doing anything like this. I assumed I might be doing some more grief coaching, but actually, what happened was that in the space of a week, maybe ten people said to me, "I need to answer these questions," and I just thought, "Oh, right, okay, I need to do something about this," and I put on a workshop and. That was about answering the questions, these really practical questions. I did a bit more research and saw what had to be done. And, and the workshop filled up. And basically, I've been, I feel like life took me by the shoulders and showed me the direction to go. But just recently, I would say that Philip has untwined himself from being involved in this. I know he's been dead eight years, but it still felt like he was really involved somehow. And of course he is, because I talk about the story all the time, but, but, but it's given me an opportunity to take it on for myself, just for myself and for everybody else. So that's that, I just wanted to highlight that. But um, yeah, when I was thinking about this, people, don't like the word aging generally speaking and they don't like the word death they don't like the word dying and they're not too keen on grief either so anything associated with end of life is very often many people will if somebody tries to start a conversation will say something like um, oh no no i don't want to go there or that's too morbid or um don't you think that's a bit off or something like that they don't want to explore but actually, what I found is that when you face death, it brings you to life. It really does. Because when you're willing to face the end, then you can be fully present here now. So I was thinking it's a little bit like when, when somebody's preparing when they're pregnant and they're preparing for the birth, they pack a bag, perhaps to go to the hospital if you're, or, or they, they, they they pack what they need in the moment of when they will need it, they think. And you're given lots of advice about that and what might happen. You have a birth plan, et cetera, et cetera. And we all know that plans don't always go according to plan, but we do have that. But we don't do it for the other end of life. Not yet. Well, we do, but not very many people do. But basically, that's what it's about. It is about getting your bag packed, ready, so that when your time comes, you can go in the best way possible. So your bag packed is really what I call your end of life plan. And that includes your will and your powers of attorney and your advance directive, the, the statement that you make if, um, about the treatment that you don't want to have should that, that be the case um 
and but it also and, and people kind of know about some of those things at least but it also includes taking care of your digital life it includes taking care of what goes on in your home for example are you the only person who knows about several things that are going on in your house in the way that the household runs what would happen if you weren't here anymore how easy would it be for somebody else to pick up the running of the household if they needed to it includes being willing to do your death cleaning, death cleaning being decluttering towards the end of life. Better to start it early than, than well, then dare I say not at all, which is what most people do because many families are left with an enormous amount of stuff that they have to take care of. And I can tell you right now from the people that I've worked with, unless you've prepared for that stuff to be taken care of properly, you've identified what you want, most of it will just get chucked out. You might be lucky, it might go to the recycling or it might go to a charity shop, shop or a thrift shop, but mostly it will just get go. Now you can say that it doesn't matter about any of this and people do say that. They say, well, I'll be dead, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of funeral I want. I don't care. But the thing is, then you're leaving your family or your friends with quite a lot of work to do. And usually, and that's an understatement actually, <laughs> usually people don't understand this until they're in that position. But I'm really passionate about having people understand it beforehand so that you can plan the best way possible to minimize the amount of time and money that is spent and the amount of stress that is caused because it's, it is not nice you know when somebody dies when they're close to you it, you you are taken over by grief and you can't think straight and that's normal that is completely normal so the last thing that you want to be doing is having to deal with the um practicalities of somebody's life that could have been taken care of beforehand so for example my mom and dad died in 2018 and they had done their end of life plans. They were really good students of mine. They thought what I was doing was wonderful. And I was their executor of their will, but me and my sister and two brothers, all we had to do was go to their workbook, their before I go workbook, where everything, all the questions were, and they'd written down their answers to everything. So we knew exactly what they wanted for their funeral. They had, they had, they had died in the same week. So we ended up having a joint funeral which sounds awful, but actually it was really, really lovely. I mean, it was horrible that they had died, but it was lovely that it happened that way in that they could still be together. And we didn't have to make any of the difficult decisions that sometimes can cause an enormous amount of arguments in families because they had told us what they wanted really specifically. And, um, and then throughout the next few months, everything that I needed as the executor to tidy up everything was just there to hand. I didn't need to go and search for anything. We talked about it all before, but it was written down and that really helps. Oh my goodness. And here's the unexpected thing. I didn't know until then that it would make me, it, that it would bring me comfort and solace to know that they had known when they were alive that I would be doing this according to their instructions. I really love that. So unexpected things can happen as well in terms of how good it can make you feel even in a time of grief. Um, what else? Yeah, I have to talk about the coronavirus right now because that is really um, up for people, but it's still really scary I'm discovering for individuals to actually think about this in relationship to their own life. It's very unlikely that somebody will die because the statistics show that most people won't, even if you do get it. However, I really recommend asking yourself, well, what would happen? What if I died? I, I did ask myself this question a few weeks ago. I, I asked, well, what about if I did die? And I realized because I was willing to face death and therefore it was bringing me to life, I realized that there was a whole area of my life that was out of balance. I was doing too much work and not enough helping my new partner to build the house that we're creating together. 
So since then, I've reorganized things and I'm down at that house every day. It's just around the corner, so it's easy to do with, um, the, even with all our restrictions, because there's never anybody else there except him, which is why it's taking a long time. <laughs> but, but the balance that I now have is great because I couldn't bear the idea that I might die and I wouldn't have been there. Well, I might not have got to move in, but at least I could have been there creating it. And now that's happening. And so that's allowed me to live my life now much more fully. And so that's what I encourage people to do as well. And I think my 10 minutes is probably up. So I just finish with my little slogan, which is a good end of life plan is a great going away present. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very, very nice. Uh, especially the last quote. <laughs> uh, death is still um, a taboo topic as well as aging, but uh, probably more even. So I would at this point invite Anne to talk about her uh, concept of, of aging, which might be inspiring to people who are taken with fear, you know. So over to you, Anne. Thank you. So my story begins uh, in 2015. I had a career management consultancy. And the last seven years of my life, I spent uh, at the Scottish Police College as a leadership development advisor. Absolutely loved it um, to have a, an end of career working with uh, police officers and in quite a leading edge environment. And then my time came to retire. And I began to go into this slightly confused state, slightly ambivalent, and I leapt into going back to university. It was like I couldn't quite come to terms with it all sort of stopping. So I went back to Stirling University and I did a master's in applied social research. And it was just a great experience being with all these young people and they took me under their wing and they taught me all of the techie stuff I needed to know. And I worked really hard. And my dissertation was grandparenting and the flow of love across the generations. Um, and I came across a book by Mary Catherine Bateson called Composing a Further Life. And she spoke about how in Eric Erickson's life cycle model, she saw that a new stage was emerging in the human life cycle called adulthood two. And we move from the stage of generativity, which is about work and parenting if you choose to have children and that busy time. Um, and each of the stages Erickson said has a virtue and a vulnerability. And the virtue of the, act of, of the adulthood two stage was active wisdom, actively sharing the, the expertise and the insights and the wisdom you'd gained from a life well lived. And the vulnerability was withdrawal. And that so spoke to me at that time about what I was going through. And she also said that there was a, an identity crisis in this transition that was of a similar order to young people going through from adolescence to adulthood. And that uh, Erickson coined this phrase identity crisis, which I think many of us are aware of. And I could feel my own identity crisis. I could feel a sense of who am I now if I don't have this parenting and the work um, and the phone stopped ringing? I wasn't as busy. And I would say it, I was, it was with me for a number of years and I've been on a journey of finding meaning for myself. I'm 68 now of this life out ahead of me. I think the other piece picking up from Jane uh, piece um, is at that time I was also what's called a club sandwich generation. Now the sandwich generation is men and women who have aging parents and children and I went from being an empty nester when my children left home and my parents were active um, to being a club sandwich generation where I had 
elderly parents, uh, four of them who were frail, adult daughters and grandchildren. And all of a sudden I was stretched into this caring lineage that I didn't see coming. And, and it stressed me, I have to say, for the first time ever, I got signed off uh, with what they called carer stress. And I'm saying carer stress, I'm not a carer, but actually I was. Uh, you know, I was babysitting and I was helping with breastfeeding and arrival of children and, grand and parents who were no longer able to look after themselves. And it was clearing the house, interestingly, Jane, that uh, ready for them to go into a care environment that tipped me over. It was throwing away other people's memories. Absolutely broke my heart, particularly as my parents' generation are often hoarders <laughs> because of the war and things, you know. So, so um, I became really aware of my own vulnerability when I hadn't sensed that before. So that took me into a journey with a colleague called Firehawk. Um, I've studied a body of earth wisdom teachings since 1996. And the wisdom part really spoke to me about our wisdom and action. And I felt it was a way for me to offer this body of teachings in a very practical and applied way to my generation. So we have devised a program called Act of Wisdom and Inquiry into Our Elderhood. And we invite people who are curious about this emerging stage of elderhood to join us in inquiry. It's not a, a program where we have all the answers. It's a program where we are in a co-creative space talking about uh, Act of Wisdom. A new piece has arrived for me recently, um, listening to uh, Dr. Zach Bush, who was speaking about the, the pandemic. And he was basically saying that our systems are crumbling, our health systems are crumbling, our political economic systems are crumbling and will continue to crumble. And that the virus is really an evolutionary mechanism to make that apparent to us as humanity. That's the big picture. But he said what we need to do is to find what he called global grassroots movements where we find our ways to bring new collective meaning uh, forward. And that really spoke to me. And I, I want to tighten the, uh, the program now. The next one starts on June 7th to work with the elders on our program to mobilize us all into what is ours to do. And uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who I'm sure Jane's uh, very familiar with, um, all of us, and the, the, the transition curve, we're in quite a lot of um, resistance and bargaining modes at the moment, and uh, which is when you come down the curve. And actually where I want to be is that time of experimenting, of coming to recognition of something, of acceptance, and then moving up the curve in a way of experimenting. And so part of the program is saying, what's the first step to what is yours to do, your unique purpose? and to do it in a way that you know you are a gem on Indra's web. I don't know if you know of Indra's net, where we're each gems um, pulsating and connected. And that really speaks to me. So it doesn't have to be a big deal what you do. It just has to be clear hearted and energetic and your desire to make a difference for the people, the projects and the communities that you care for whatever is yours to do. And I just love it. This is my grassroots global movement, working with elders, opening up the space for them to make meaning in that, I'm getting emotional now, to make meaning in their lives, because we as a generation are a huge resource that can be brought forward to save humanity at the, the biggest level, but to be happy and productive uh, in this lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. 
Yeah, we and need Heidi, to. I've, I need to just go off and take care of this, but I'll hopefully be able to come back in again. I'm really sorry. Okay, that was lovely, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's really important that we find the right way of being in the world in, in times of challenges. And it's, it's a question which I have too. I have the feeling for me, the right way is collecting people around me and talking and, and trying to figure out, inquiring, it's I think your work, inquiring in what we could be and do uh, to face life in this sense. Uh, at this point, I would go over to Bettina because she is, uh, as a gerontologist is concerned with, let's say, people who, who need her, who, whose life is not so easy when they go into uh, older ages. And so maybe we bring that up now. Bettina, up to you. Yes, um, but while I was li listening and I, I changed my plan to talk about, I hope it's okay. <laughs> um, My, my my thinking and my 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 consciousness about aging has changed in the last years rapidly and um but i want want to start at, at at the beginning from where i was drawn to to integral and and and, and aging and dementia because when it, it was about 2002 when i read uh, wilba first and I, immediately thought you have to put dementia in the middle of this quadrant model. And so I started to doing my research and, um, and I still work with it, with this, but, um, and it's important. And I think that's, that's, that's one of, of, of um, my, my work, which perhaps I should be more bold to, to, to go out with it. Um, really, taking the, 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 the quadrant model, the integral map, when we look on aging, seeing every quadrant um, is appearing in aging and is appearing out of aging. It's, it's both. It's, it's, um, we look from, uh, when we, we look from, from aging, we have four perspectives, the, the, the individual, inner, um, the inner individual, the outer individual, um, the inner collective and the outer collective. We have all these aspects um, which we feel inside of us when we are aging and which creates us in this aging, both parts. And that's so complex. And that's the, the topic uh, of, of, the, of the other part where I look, or where I do more work with now is um, taking the developmental models and working with that because that's, I think that's really important helping um, to um, this, this um, development of the eye emerging more and more and more. Integral, um, the integral stage is, is um, a stage of complexity. It's, it's, it, it's a possibility not, not just to see all of these aspects of aging. I feel and I do and my body and my networks and my, 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 my bank account and all these aspects but it's it's really the the, the possibility or the, the 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 movement to embody it more and more to feel it coming out of me and this is one of my yeah i think that that is the work what i'm doing helping people getting more and more of this uh, being aware more and more aware of this complexity but at the same time we have to see that it's that there are um, stages who are, we call them earlier stages and they can't these are people who can't see that this complexity and who can't hold this complexity and they um, yes we have to develop um, pathways for 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 every stage for for um, for finding good solutions for the aging. I think um, there was a lot of resonance when you were talking, Anne. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, 
and we can see it when we, we switch to dementia that people um, with dementia go into a regression more and more and more and you can describe it with the with this with the stages of development and i use um spirodynamics and i use um terrier Fallon's model um of stages and um for me as um a professional in this field it seems really important to yeah that sounds a little bit arrogant but to educate people more and more in 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 in, in, in taking this complexity or learning the, about this complexity and um, yeah that that's the that's a regular my regular view so that where, where i can talk open and then there's another thing and that is the involutionary and the evolutionary part of um or aspect of um, aging of dementia and um, that arise has arised more and more me in the last two years and when we normally we look on aging as a as an evolutionary <laughs> as a regressive part of the body it becomes more and more disposable um, and at the same time we in the integral movement we look in an evolutionary way the eye becomes more and more and more aware of it and we have the the dream that in in the last moment there will be and i think there will uh, be um uh, this yeah the, the awakening the, the absolute and it will be but it it's it's helpful to to learn to trust in this <laughs> um during lifetime and then there is the involutionary way. And I look into this and I dive into this more and more. I'm, um, because from every step on the stages, um, we, we are the involutionary impact on aging at the same time. Involutionary is for me the the, this was what comes from the from the absolute and go, goes down into the manifest and we and this is the creation the creation the evolutionary impulse uh, the involutionary impulse and we all created we are the absolute and we created with and becoming more and more way aware of this involutionary power we all have with our thoughts and our consciousness consciousness about aging and learning to become careful about that what we create about aging in our daily thoughts yes that's that's the thing I, i'm drawn more and more to and now i could do the switch to dementia again but i think it's too it would take too long it would be too complicated so that it was a short impulse Thank you. I think after Monia has spoken, we will substitute the audience and ask questions among each other. So we might find some question for you too. I, I do. <laughs> so Monia, you... Okay. Integral life practice. Integral life practice. Just before we, we start, um, could we pop into the chat any thoughts yes, for sure. the questions? So do that. do that'd that. be great. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, I came across the integral map of consciousness at around age 60. And it helped to sort out what I had gone through until this time. And I have uh, practiced uh, various new age practices and with the integral life map, uh, I finally saw that, first of all, you still develop, even if you are 60 and over. And secondly, uh, there is a pattern you can use. Uh, Wilbur devoted his integral life practice to the body, development of the body, the mind and the soul. And at age 60, of course, I, I didn't wait, start weightlifting or anything like that. I l just learned how to adapt to my um, 
Yeah, to my feeling that uh, I won't age, I'll stay young all the time. And of course the body signal, sends signals. And I, uh, I concentrated not on running uh, 800 miles. I just concentrated on my subtle body. So I used my breath uh, and developed a new kind of awareness by doing this. Uh, actually, I would recommend breath work to everybody because the breath is what qualifies you and what defines you, how you breathe. Um, working with the mind was just natural for me because I've been a reading and writing person all my life. So reading Wilbur's work was just uh, a delight for me. And then I started to notice that I have to pay more attention to my intuition, to the gut feeling and trust it. So this is something maybe I really can do now after age 70. I trust my intuition. I trust my female intuition, as they say. Um, <clears throat> and it works. It works very, very effectively. Of course, you still use your mind. You don't forget your mind. It's always good to have a mind. But it's not the priority anymore for me. And working with the soul, <laughs> uh, to nourish my essence, I found that working with women is the easiest way to nourish my soul. So whenever we come together here in the female consciousness field, uh, most of us leave after our sessions with a feeling of being nourished, of having your heart go out to everybody else. And this is, uh, at any age, very important, I feel. So nourishing, loving yourself, but not egotistically, but just like you should love everybody else, you should love yourself first. Now, uh, we have talked about two taboo topics and I would like to add a third particularly in old age and that is sex and so it's not common to talk about sex after 70. Uh, on the other hand uh, when going deeper into Buddhism and Buddhist training uh, there is the tantric practices and so what do you do when your body isn't as attractive anymore? Are you shy about it or does it hinder you? On the other hand, you start to recognize the essence of the other person. And so maybe even the tantric practices develop into the subtle body. We used to call it energy work. Um, you never leave the soul out of your practices. You always are very much aware of the causal body, the body that uh, includes whatever it is. And you surrender. I know this is a very, very much used uh, word in the 70s, but you surrender and by surrendering, you lead. And that's very, uh, so in the tantric practices, the female qualities lead, whether they are in the man or they are in the woman. That doesn't, the female qualities 
lead the other person. Yeah, I'm wondering if there are any questions. <laughs> yeah, we can open now the room for questions. In the conference, we would uh, have questions of the people who had before a chance to talk in breakout rooms themselves about what is conscious aging for them, as we don't have that now. Yeah, let's ask uh, reciproco in Italian, each other uh, questions, you know. So, and you have already, uh, do you say bought it down? Slot it down? I, I forget English, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> the words. Uh, I, I, I think the first question for me is, I didn't put sufficient integral into my presentation. I wonder, you know, listening to Bettina. So I just wondered that's a learning piece uh, uh, for us to take on. Um, so what I loved, I did a program called Tetradynamics with Sean, I can never say his name, Esbon Hargens. Mm -hmm. So it was a whole program looking at how to apply the four quadrants and I just loved it. And he taught us to look as something through the lens of the four quadrants and to look at something. And, and just I was thinking about looking at conscious aging as and then looking at conscious aging and what, what, what might we say. So that was just a, a little bit of inquiry um, that I thought was good. And I think the other thing for me is the question around adult development in our later years, you know, um, what the argument, uh, when I interviewed John Freeman around spinal dynamics for my blog, uh, we, we really looked into that, you know, having more space, more resource, more time. Um, there is the potential for um, us to grow, you know, in the way that Integral speaks to. So those are just points I would make at the moment um, from what I heard. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to to mention that the common understanding is when you are 60, you are old. And, you know, here in the villages, the 60 year old people, they don't look like me. They look like, you know, and go all the How they speak about life, it's as, as if it was over. At all. Not hear her. Oops. She's. Oh, she's frozen. Fro she's frozen. Yeah, she's frozen. Well, I'll give her a minute, maybe. Yeah, she'll... I think we can continue. <laughs> yeah, it's. It's the um, it's it's the idea of sixty being old. I'm sixty two, and I'm like, what? That was silly. Sixty's mm -hmm. not old. <laughs> right. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's always, there is always an edge. My edge yeah. is 80 now because 80 is, um, well, most of our friends just died before they became 80. So this is mm. last year and that was really hard. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I have an aunt who became <laughs> 103, uh, but I wouldn't want to be, to develop the way she did. She was just sitting in a chair and was sedated or they gave her some uh, pills to make her really happy. And she just sat there and was, yeah, that's not the way I would like to become 103. So maybe we should really set an edge and say, I have a friend who has a, uh, he cuts off one centimeter every week from, uh, I don't know, he thinks he will become as 80 or something. And so a perspective of how much time we still have left. And that really makes you much alerter to what you're doing right now. Mm. Heidi, welcome back. 
Yeah, I hope I will be back for longer. <laughs> That's the problem when you are not in person and when you depend on the internet. I was about saying that uh, Mark was 60 when he discovered Ken Wilber and uh, this other mindset. I, I'm much earlier, but the, the idea that with 60 you are old and everything goes downhill, I think it's very much hindering us and uh, to, 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 to believe that we can go ahead. And um, it also ties in with Bettina, I guess, because uh, you said when the inner left, left above quadrant, no? when you have this uh, feeling that you are, life is over, it's much more easy. So at least I understood you, what you said in our conversation to, to, to become dementia because you, what, what are you living for? You, you can quite as well forget everything. So that's my short interpretation of that. So what uh, my interest is in continuing the, 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 the series is to have people allow them to understand that there is a complete new life waiting for you if you engage into it, if you want it. And I see that you all are in the same boat with me and let's get it out. So I was thinking that um, I've heard this, this phrase that old is always 15 years older than what you are at the time. And I like, I quite like that because when you said about 60, Heidi, I was like, that can't be right because I'm 62 and, and that, I'm not old, you know, it's just like, <laughs> and yet I know that younger people think that I am. And actually when I'm building the house, sad to say my body doesn't quite do it in the way that it would have done a few years ago. <laughs> so, but I kind of like that idea of old being always, it's always out there, you know? I don't know if you can feel like that if when you're actually actually older than that. I don't know. But it's a kind of bit sobering because it's like, Monia, you said you were 78. Is that right? 78. So I'm like, she, she could practically be my mum. I mean, that can't be right. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. It all seems a bit mad. Moms never talk about sex, right? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so sorry that I missed your presentation, Bettina, and, and half of yours. I will, come, I will come back and listen to the recording, though, because that would have been very interesting. But anyway. I will send you my, all my presentation from uh, 2018 about integral gerontology. I forgot it. I found it and I was sent. It's not, it's not that what I think now but it, it shows my, my thinking from 2018. And it's, right. there are some maps in it. Um, one of the things for me was this identity crisis piece that became clear. Um, and one of the, is catching the thoughts around aging. Uh, you know, the shadow work that we talk about. And what I realized was, I was carrying this thought that I was beyond my sell by date professionally. I had reached a point where people would look at me now and consider me beyond my sell-by date. And therefore, I wasn't um, attractive in the way that I used to be as someone who could be pretty effective. You know? so, and I, I worked with that. And I, and I worked with looking in the mirror and seeing wrinkles. You know? So I, I don't think it's that. I didn't skim past the aging process at all. Um, and one of the things that I found when I really looked into this was I had an out of balance pattern when I was growing up around being pretty. Mm. And I used, I was a bit of a flirt. I was a bit of a, you know, I, I, and my husband used to say to me, you get away with things because your out of balance and this stuff is sweet. Whereas my out of balance stuff is grumpy and, you know, um, in your face a bit, you know. So I really had to work with it. That's my honest truth. And I would say I'm still a work in progress. I still find there's times when I'm sitting at the computer and I can see. You know? <laughs> and, that, and not to kid ourselves. 
that we're smoothly on this trajectory, you know, but to, to be honest. But then I've just recently been on a program called Quest for Next, where I am the elder on the program of young people who are in a purpose quest. And I know I'm valued. You know, I know that um, they appreciate what I'm bringing. And that is lovely. But there's an honest truth that I, I hold. I'm wondering. It's beautiful that you have the possibility yeah. to, 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 be, to be giving to, to younger people and be appreciated for that. So really good. Monia, excuse me, go ahead. I'm wondering uh, whether we are ready to be role models and not shrink back from that. Because uh, to be appreciated and I can relate to your uh, flirting attitude, Anne, because that's the easiest way to get around, isn't it? <laughs> and yeah why not use it why not use it so it's it's not i'm not ashamed of being found attractive it's just in about 10 years i'll have so many wrinkles that i'll just <laughs> fail myself <laughs> or i use the the you know this <laughs> corona shield um, Why would you do that? We have to <laughs> learn to be in our age as we right, are. Right, I mean, right, I look right. in, the, in the mirror and see these, these things and I think, oh, okay, but why do we so much give value to that? You know, that's the question. Well, that's the way we were brought up. Mm -hmm. Nice petticoats and always washed hands and clear eyes. Yeah. Okay. For me, there's uh, beauty is wonderful, you know. So I'm I'm absolutely for beauty, and uh, but for I for me it was catching the thought when it was diminishing me, when um, I wasn't flowing energetically because I was there was some shadow. Uh, playing out through me and and catching that and working with it has been the practice that I that we all you know in our integral life practice catch what it is that takes us um, out of that flow the present moment um, being fully who we are Yeah, wonderful. In the conference, there would be people asking you questions and you would be responding. We did a little bit of a conversation among us and I think it's fine. I would like uh, th uh, that we make a sort of a summary or a check out what, what, what is for in for you and what do you think uh, will be the impact on you and on the people who will be listening uh, at the or oh, watching at the conference. Oh, what impact do you want to to have to, to give to them? Uh, so I have a question about that then, Heidi, which is are we supposed to be give, giving people um, an opportunity for a next step in the in the work that we do if they want that or or not? I do think so. I will also uh, bring into the chat the appearances you had with me on the Wisdom Factory and where they can find about you and you know uh, you, you can say what you are doing it's valuable okay. work everybody okay. who, who is doing something which is appearing on a, on a website that can be published uh, whatever you know I, I th we are doing this also for inspire people but also for give them the possibility okay. to to take steps if they want you don't yeah. force them you just yeah, yeah. tell them that's a possibility and yeah. okay and then just one other question then for my wrap up is um alan said about not having mentioned anything about integral well i didn't either and that's really because i'm not 
I'm like, not exactly, well, I'm not an integral student. I do like Ken Wilber's work, but I haven't studied that much of it. So I haven't mentioned it at all. I assume that is okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you. But I found this yeah, very, um, this is, this, this, coming on the call today, because I had to reorganize a few things. I was like, oh, why am I doing this? And then I remembered the impact of the last call that we had. And I couldn't say it in words, but I knew that I felt really good afterwards and during and afterwards. And this is, I feel like that as well now. So I don't know what that is particularly, whether it's, a, it's probably a combination of the subject plus all of us and our individual inputs to this. But, um, you know, I feel humbled and very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who wants to go next? All right, I'll go next. Because that's what I mentioned was that you are nourished by being open and being in the present. And I guess this is one of the most important experiences to have that once you are in the present, everything is fine. It's just what you project into the future or what you are pulled back into the past. You have to stay with your breath in the present moment. Then you are just okay. Everything's okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I'm awake now. <laughs> <laughs> an hour and a half later, I'm awake. I've enjoyed the conversation and I love the different flavours of us. I think we're a, we're a nice combination. You know, if you imagine we're um, a five course dinner, <laughs> um, there's, there's a, a lovely flow and um, complementary nature. Um, to each of us um, and I've loved where we've gone each of us in terms of sharing what's important to us um, so I feel I'm flowing into my day well I'm ready for my breakfast so I'm imagining now what my breakfast is going to be so I'm ready for that um, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you a week on Saturday at eight o'clock <laughs> Eight o'clock UK time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm always a little bit confused because I can't um, really express what I'm thinking or what there is to be expressed. Um, I'm better in that, in German in that. So that's always the same. Um, and There is one aspect of aging in, in the now. I'm, I'm not sure if I should express it. <laughs> and yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit. Um, but I think I can and can can contribute. Um, so I will be there. But I didn't. I forgot the time at, at nine in the morning next Saturday. Saturday. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. To get uh, get up an hour earlier, no, to be fit at that time. Yeah. That doesn't help. Anyway, we will Thank make you. it. And uh, it is not said that when we are there that we will talk about the same things. Who knows? You know. And that's the nice thing in groups like like we are doing. We are not so much scripting. I did the presentation at the beginning just to to have people see a little bit the things, but. We are not reading what has been done before, but we are speaking out of the moment. And I appreciate that. And I think this is a big part of what is giving us the feeling of being together and of, of, of you know, this, what Monia said, this, uh, speaking among women. We, we are much more, mo most of the time, open to, to this flow instead of needing to go into a fixed direction. And I'm glad that I have found you <laughs> and you came, you followed the call and we will see what comes out on, 
on Saturday next week. And thank, thank you, you, everybody. And who is watching that, don't uh, forget to connect with the people. At, go back to the video at the beginning. I have written their websites, and you can find that. OK, thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.